Hello, everybody, and welcome to the fifth and final session of the History of Vestments on Papal Vestments with Dr. Cynthia Tulin Wilson. Before we begin, uh, Sister Ngoff, would you please lead us in prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God, Father, we gather here today under your care and protection. Thank you for your loving kindness that never fail us. We thank you for those with us that you would guide our thoughts and action to bring you glory, strengthen us, and fill us with your peace. May we love and serve each other as Jesus has sold us. Fill us with the Holy Spirit to do your good work on earth. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank, you, Thank you, sister. You're welcome. Yes. So, so uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Cynthia Tulin Wilson, uh, <laughs> she's the academic chief academic officer as well as an online professor of dogmatic and moral theology at Holy Apostles College and Seminary in Cromwell, Connecticut. She also hosts WCAT Radio's Author to Author, a program in which she interviews Catholic authors to assist Catholic readers in identifying Orthodox Catholic content. She is the author herself of two books entitled The Story of Holy Apostles and Survivor, A Memoir of Forgiveness. Dr. Tulin Wilson, take it away. Take it away. I feel like I'm on a famous show. Um, first, I want to uh, explain and ask uh, for a favor. Um, we didn't have class last week uh, because my stepdaughter, um, my husband's daughter, um, had uh, some medical problems. She's still in St. Francis Hospital and uh, still in very serious condition. She had... Uh, I don't think she'll ever find out I divulged this, so I suppose it's okay. But she had uh, a hernia for 10 years, never said anything to anybody. It got strangled, and uh, she has a bad heart, bad lungs. So she's been on a ventilator now for, well, since last Tuesday, seven days. She's been on a ventilator for seven days. So, um, and she's getting tired, which is certainly very understandable and she's um discouraged and just a tad crabby which she is not usually um so um that explains why i wasn't here uh last week uh however <clears throat> here we are it's another wednesday and um i wouldn't say that she's gotten seriously worse but she hasn't gotten any better so um i would um appreciate prayers, and if you could, um, you know, I've told people that I know, and if you could ask people you know to pray for her. Uh, her name is Linda Romano, and uh, she's a fine woman. Um, she really is a fine woman. She's got uh, four children, adult children. Two of them are married. She's got three great-grandchildren, and, you know, it's like, or three grandchildren, they're my great grandchildren. <laughs> um, but anyway, so um, I'd appreciate any prayers. So um, moving past that to the actual lecture. Uh, so I hope uh, that you've enjoyed uh, the lectures to this point. Um, I have tried to cover uh, material that uh, focused on things that you may not be aware of. I mean, we can all probably sit down and name off the vestments that um, <clears throat> different levels of the clergy wear. But to give a little history of it and to give a sense of um, to give a sense of the symbolism and also to see the complexity. Uh, so in this uh, lecture, I'm talking about papal vestments, but the two things that come to me as I talk about these, first of all, as I've mentioned before, you could do, and we don't offer that, of course, but you could do an MA in this kind of thing. I started reading about papal shoes, and hours later, um, I realized I may have gone overboard. 
but the information, you know, is so fascinating and um, is so symbolic uh, that a person, after the hours that I spent looking at shoes, I thought, you know, somebody could write a master's thesis on the Pope's shoes. So um, I want to give you that sense, even though I haven't taught you that level of depth. Um, but I do want you to be aware that this is, uh, this could easily be like swimming in the ocean. And um, also the symbolism, one of the things, as I've mentioned before, one of the things I love about being Catholic is the tremendous amount of, of symbolism. And when you get to the uh, papal vestments, you, uh, you see even more symbolism. So um, I personally love this topic. I hope that's come across and um, I hope that you have uh, enjoyed what you've learned so far. Uh, so to begin, um, since the Pope is a bishop, uh, the Bishop of Rome, uh, he wears many of the clericals and the vestments of other bishops, as well as their accoutrements and insignia. Uh, the insignia, um, in the case of the papacy, are known as regalia. So the regalia of the papacy is uh, the distinctive clothing worn and the ornaments carried at formal indication as a, at formal occasions as an indication of status. These include, for instance, the triple uh, tiara or the triple crown, the ring of the fisherman and the staff. So um, other regalia have been discontinued, but they've not been abolished. Um, and some of the other insignia, which I'll, I'll just touch upon, which I find fascinating myself, are, for instance, the crossed keys, which I've always seen the crossed keys with this big crown over it, but I never knew what it meant. So uh, maybe you already do, but I, I found it to be an interesting topic. So starting with this uh, insignia or the regalia, um, the, um, the image of a gold and silver key crossed over each other in an X, okay? So uh, in the shape of a St. Andrew's cross. Uh, because as far as we know, that's how he was crucified. He was not crucified erect as Christ was. He was crucified as if he was on an X. So that's why we obviously call it St. Andrew's cross. The crossed keys uh, represent the keys to the kingdom of heaven. In Matthew 16, verse 19, Jesus says to Simon Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I mean, that's probably one of the most significant uh, passages uh, that are emphasized in our faith. So what this does is it establishes the jurisdiction of heaven, the gold key, and earth, the silver key. So the church has that jurisdiction of both heaven and earth, represented by these two keys, to bind and to loose. Uh, another interpretation, which is not as popular, is that popular possibly the silver key represents uh, to bind and the gold to loose. Uh, this image uh, continues on the, primus, the primary emblem of the papacy. The two keys uh, as a as a St. Andrew's cross underneath the papal tiara, which is a crown with three levels used since the eighth century. And it went through many, many developments. So again, somebody who's ambitious, um, if you wanted to do a study of that alone, you know, the, uh, the development of the uh, papal tiara is fascinating. Went through many developments. In theory, uh, there were three levels to the crown, uh, a golden crown, literally gold, not golden color. Um, it was three levels so that the popes could show that their spiritual authority was equal to temporal authority. And um, when I read that, it's like, well, what exactly does that mean? You know, but what it means is at that time, uh, we had the Holy Roman Emperor and he was 
crowned three times the king of Germany, the king of Italy, and the Roman emperor. So the tiara, the, the papal tiara, the papal crown, is basically telling us that in symbolism, that this spiritual authority of the church, of the Pope, is equal to the temporal authority of the Holy Roman Emperor. Now, that might not seem like much because we're way past the Holy Roman Emperor Empire, but guess what? Just try telling somebody uh, in the state that you disagree with transgender, um, that you are fighting for pro-life, or that you are uh, concerned with, um, you know, any number of uh, things like divorce and remarriage. So um, what you will find is backlash. Now, of course, backlash in the Roman Empire meant uh, probably death. Uh, hopefully it doesn't usually mean that here. But my point is that that symbolism is still something that we can use today because we live in a world and in a secular world here in the United States, we live in a secular world. And to think that the church has, you know, the church does have the same authority as, as much authority as the temporal authority, but don't ask anybody who isn't a Catholic because they will not agree. So the fight continues long after the Roman empire. Anyway, so the tiara, which is really a thing of beauty to say, it was replaced by a mitre, uh, which depicts the papacy's three-tiered cross. Um, so Benedict the, the 16th and Francis did not wear the tiara. They used a mitre. And of course, we talked about that uh, when we talked about bishops. This symbol is also used on the Pope's personal coat of arms with the red lappets. We talked about them last week, the things that hang down on the back. Um, like ribbons, uh, as well as the coat of arms of the Holy See and of the Vatican City. So the Triple Tiara has relevance for us today. Um, I guess if you live in the esoteric world I live in. Anyway, uh, the second um, piece of regalia is the Ring of the Fisherman. Now remember we talked about uh, the Bishop's Ring. Well, the Ring of the Fisherman um, is a thing of beauty. Uh, each um, pope gets one. It's um, a gold ring, and it's decorated um, on, you know, on the flat part with a depiction of St. Peter in a boat casting his net, which is kind of exactly saying what the pope is supposed to be doing in this vocation. And around the outside of the ring is the name of the new pope. So this started in 1265, and it was used uh, initially to seal public documents and private letters. And then by the 15th century, it was used to seal papal briefs. It is put on the newly elected Pope's finger when he's elected. And on his death, the Cardinal Chamberlain used to deface and smash the ring with a hammer as a sign of the end of the deceased Pope's authority. Um, I found that to be interesting, the defacing and smashing of the ring um, to end the deceased Pope's authority. Because even though the, obviously the Pope is no longer on earth if he's dead, um, but when you think of the magisterial documents that these men write, um, you know, with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, that authority, um, you know, it's, it lingers on at some level, at the human level, I think, but of course through the Holy Spirit. I mean, you know, I love the encyclicals. I love the old documents. I'm one of the most boring women you'll ever meet. So, you know, my idea of a good time is to read Rerum Novarum by Leo the Thirteenth. you know, and um, that, that has tremendous impact on people even today. You know, it's written in the, you know, early 1900s. So I just thought the defacing of the ring was of interest. Popes today, uh, the fourth uh, piece of regalia, uh, the popes today carry a staff 
uh, that was an ancient custom, not a crozier. And we've talked about the crozier, which is uh, similar to a shepherd's crook um, uh, when we were talking about the bishops. So the popes carry a staff and it is topped by a crucifix. And I think that uh, the, being topped by a crucifix is also very important. I'm sure that as um, good Catholics, I mean, if you weren't a good Catholic, you wouldn't be sitting here listening to me being, you know, talking about something esoteric. But um, the difference between a cross and a crucifix, which is something most people uh, in the Catholic world need to be taught about. You know, it's like, yeah, the, you know, the cross doesn't have the, the corpus, the crucifix does. So what? It's what we focus on. It's we, we're focusing on the sacrifice and on the passion. And that's, um, you know, and that redeeming quality. So, um, you know, that's, uh, it's interesting that it is a crucifix on the top and not just a cross. Other regalia have been discontinued, but not abolished. Um, I would love to have seen one of these. Uh, there was a portable throne carried by 12 men in red uniforms, accompanied by two men carrying large ceremonial fa fans made of white ostrich feathers. Okay, so it was um, kind of um, like something you'd see in one of those, you know, cartoon movies like Aladdin or something, where someone is actually being picked up by, you know, four or more men and carried. Um, so um, there is a picture uh, that I happened to see on the computer of uh, one of the popes sitting next to the white ostrich feathers. And I just thought that was great. You know, um, we're a religion that has, uh, I remember the old saying, smells and bells, but we're also a religion of all the senses. So when you think of seeing something like that, I mean, obviously the white ostrich feathers are beautiful, but what do they signify? You know, it's like, it's, um, it's elevating. Okay. And then uh, let's see. So John Paul II stopped the um, portable throne. Uh, and then there's something called the umbraculum umbraculum. It is no longer used, although it continues to be used on ecclesiastical heraldry. It's a little umbrella, um, if you think of like a beach umbrella. It's a little umbrella of red and gold stripes, which are the traditional colors of Rome. And it was carried by a man behind the Pope to provide shade. So um, all of these things, you know, these were only uh, of access to the Pope. Um, you know, he was the only one that used them. And um, it's just interesting to see, you know, the, the routineness of, gee, Rome in the summer is hot, the Pope needs shade. Um, and also uh, then the opposite end of the luxury of being carried on a throne. So the next thing that I want to talk about um, is papal vestments. So there's really not a whole lot new here. We're talking about mostly the same vestments, but we're talking about them in a different way uh, sometimes. So first, uh, the papal vestments uh, include the vestments, um, the mitre, uh, the pallium, that's only for the, um, only for the, uh, for the very high, the fanon, which is only for the Pope, the chasuble, the stole, and the papal dalmatic. The Pope wears a mitre, which we discussed last time, um, you know, something that looks like um, two triangles or two shells that are put together and then sewn uh, and have uh, two um, like ribbons coming off of the back. Um, obviously it's a sign of authority. Uh, he wears a chasuble uh, with a pallium over it. We've not discussed the pallium before. It is a circular band of fabric about two inches uh, in width. And there are two 12 inch long pen, like pendants almost that hang down from it. 
one in the front and one in the back. So if you think of it, it's kind of like you have a necklace on in the front, but you have the same thing on in the back. Um, it is ornamented with six small black crosses distributed across the shoulders, the breast, and the back. And it's fixed in place by three golden pins, which are symbolic of the nails with which Christ was crucified. Now, interestingly, um, I was reading that and I said three golden pins. And um, I suppose other people have, have gone through the same weird thought because it's like four limbs, three pins. And then I realized that one of the nails had to go through both feet because his feet were crossed. And that gave me a whole new level of horror because it's one thing to have a nail go through your wrist, that's bad enough. But think of something going through both of your feet at the same time. I mean, that's just a horror. But um, I had never, I was like, why aren't there four golden pins? And then I realized it's because his two feet were together and were nailed together. Um, so they're symbolic of the nails with which uh, Christ was hung onto the crucifix. The Pope wears the pallium by right. He has the right to wear it at all ecclesiastical functions without restrictions in the Latin Western rite of the church. Others may wear it. Um, for instance, metropolitans, these are archbishops who are senior bishops of an ecclesiastical province, but they have to receive the pallium from the Pope. They're not wearing it on their own. So they receive it from the Pope personally or in a ceremony at which another bishop delegated by the Pope presides. So it's either given uh, directly to the person or indirectly through um, another bishop who is presiding at a, at a um, service. So only though the Pope can wear it by right. In 2005, uh, when Pope Benedict was inaugurated, he introduced a special type of pallium and that is worn only by the Pope. Um, it is based on an earlier form of the pallium, similar to um, one that is still worn by Eastern bishops. It's wider and it's longer, um, and it has red crosses on it instead of black ones. On the feasts of St. Peter and Paul in 2014, uh, Pope Francis um, stopped using the one that Pope Benedict had uh, inaugurated or had started using. Um, and returned to the usual black pallium. The next thing is the fanon. Uh, the only the Pope can wear the fanon, F-A-N-O-N, which is um, very rich looking. It's made of alternating silver and gold stripes. It's similar to a shawl in shape, you know, kind of triangular. One end is passed under the stole, the other end is passed over the chasuble, um, and the pallium is then placed over it. This is something that's rarely used now, although both John Paul II and Benedict XVI wore it a few times, a few on a few occasions. Prior to the liturgical reforms of Vatican Council II, there were other vestments worn only by the Pope. Uh, the sub -centorium, it's a strip of embroidered fabric similar to a maniple, we've talked about the maniple before, which was suspended from the cincture. It was embroidered with a cross and the Agnus Dei. The falda is a particular papal vestment which forms a long skirt and extending beyond the helm of the alb. Uh, the skirts of the falda were so long that the Pope had train bearers, this is a little odd, in front of and in back of him when he walked 
So, you know, you'll see a woman, you know, some rich woman, and she has on a gown with a long train in back, and someone's walking behind her carrying the train. Well, in the case of the falda, the Pope has someone in front of him carrying it and in back of him carrying it. Um, there is also the mantum. It's a very long cope worn only by the Pope. Originally, it was red in color, but later was made to correspond to the liturgical colors. So if you think of this, you have this very long skirt and you have this very long cope. And so when the Pope would stand on his throne or prior to the elimination of the carrying throne was standing in front of the carrying throne, both the falda and the mantum would flow down to the lower steps. And that had the effect of making the Pope look taller than anybody else that was present. All three of these vestments were discontinued during the reign of Pope Paul VI. If we move for a minute to the more uh, routine clothes, as you recall, the uh, first lesson I talked about uh, cassocks and, and things like that. So I wanna call, talk about choir and house dress for the Pope. So um, really like any priest, uh, when not celebrating religious services, the Pope wears or can wear a cassock. Uh, the choir cassock is worn when he is attending but not celebrating the service. So he's not the celebrant. And on formal occasions, such as audiences. The house cassock is ordinary house dress, um, worn for daily use and not for liturgical services. So, you know, I was thinking about house dress today and it's like, that's not meaning it's something just worn inside. I assume you know that it's just your everyday wear. Um, and so the house cassock is what we would find in a, in a department store where it says everyday wear. Um, so worn for daily use, not for liturgical services. The first thing we notice uh, when we deal with the Pope is that he is wearing a white cassock and a white zucchetto skull cap. We had talked about that last week. So he wears a white cassock and a white skull cap. He sticks out of a crowd, especially if you have a whole bunch of, or a whole group, I shouldn't say bunch of uh, bishops, archbishops, cardinals, whatever. Um, and they're all in reds or purples and he's all in white. He sticks out and that's what he's supposed to do. The cassock, uh, that, uh, the white cassock used to have a train on it, but Pope Pius XII discontinued that. For convenience, when there was the train, it could be folded up and fastened to the back of the cassock. The Pope also wore a tufted fascia Remember that we talked about that white sash-like belt around the waist instead of a cincture, the ends of which fall down past the knees and were often embroidered with the Pope's coat of arms. Paul VI replaced um, the fascia with a simple fringe sash, white of course. Over the cassock, the Pope will wear a lay lace roche, and over that red papal mozzetta, a shoulder cape that has a collar and is buttoned all the way down the front. The red color is from the days when scarlet was the papal color. It white only became associated with the papacy after the Napoleonic Wars. The papal uh, mozzetta had a small hood on the back, which disappeared after Vatican II, but has been restored. In the winter, it was made of red velvet trimmed with ermine. Um, that also fell of use, out of use after Vatican II, but Pope Benedict XVI um, began a, again to wear a winter one trimmed in ermine fur. In the summer, the papal mozzetta is of red satin, the Pope wears a pectoral cross suspended on a gold cord over it. He may also wear a red stole with gold embroidery over the mozzetta, even when he is not officiating at a service. 
The house cassock is white with an attached uh, pellegrina uh, in fringed white fascia, often with a papal coat of arms embroidered on it. A pectoral cross hung on a gold cord, red papal shoes, and the white skull cap. On a more formal occasion, he may wear a red cape, um, familiar to the Fia Olo, with gold direction, decoration, or a red cap with a shoulder cape attached. Outdoors, the Pope can wear red or white, a uh, wide-brimmed hat, used in general by the clergy, although in general, the clergy would be wearing black, not white or red. During the octave of Easter, the Pope wears the white Paschal Mozzetta, which is a white damask silk trimmed with white ermine. As I was writing this, I thought that ermine are probably becoming a scarce animal. It fell out of fa fashion during the reign of John Paul II, but was returned to use in 2008 by Pope Benedict XVI. So too, he restored the Kama, oh, oh, this is a hard word, Kama Oro red, cap, red velvet cap that covers the ear, trimmed with ermine. So you see a pattern here, um, and we're going to in the next paragraph, where Pope Benedict XVI, it's important to see how the different popes could influence what people were wearing. All right, so people would move towards something simpler, and Benedict came along and he said, no, we want to return to the tradition. And so they did. So it's kind of like this dance between the old and the new. The old never goes away. It's always there to be brought back. And um, I think that that's something that's beautiful. Okay, so the Pope uh, traditionally, now this is where we get into shoes. And like I was saying about vestments, you could write a thesis on this. The Pope traditionally wears special red satin or velvet papal slippers indoors made of red velvet or red silk, heavily decorated in gold braid with a gold cross in the middle and red leather papal shoes outdoors. John Paul II would sometimes wear black or brown shoes. Uh, Benedict XVI, you guessed it, he returned to red papal shoes. Francis returned to black shoes. So why is the red so important? I mean, it's not a fashion statement. All right, red was used to rep, this is just beautiful to me. Red was used to represent the blood of Catholic martyrs through the centuries, following in Christ's footsteps. So his footprints were bloodied. Think of his walk on the Via Dolorosa, where he'd already been beaten on his way to the crucifixion and when his feet were pierced by one nail. The red shoes symbolize the submission of the Pope to the ultimate authority of Jesus Christ. They also signify God's burning love for humanity as exhibited during the Pentecost when red vestments are worn to commemorate the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles as tongues of fire upon their heads. So to me, this is very interesting. You know, there's uh, sandals that the, the uh, Pope used to wear. Uh, there were all kinds of shoes he used to wear, but red and why red? You know, when you think of bloodied footprints, you know, so if you cut your foot on grass, a uh, glass, and you walk, um, you know, multiply that many, many times over for Christ. And that's what we remember when we were where, when they, not we, but when the popes wear the red shoes. Scarlet was the papal color until the Napoleonic Wars. And uh, this I find, uh, again, it's an interesting fact, uh, a social fact. So um, scarlet was the papal color until the Napoleonic Wars when it was changed to white. And the reason it was turned to white was Pope Pius V, who was a Dominican. So when he became Pope, he changed the papal color to white. So the red items of which we are speaking 
those are all that are left of that tradition. But as a Dominican, his habit was white. And so he changed papal color from scarlet or red to white. Okay. Any questions? I have a question about the bishop's ring. Um, if the bishop becomes a cardinal, does the ring change or does he carry that ring with him? Um, can I can I put something out there? I of course Claire. You can. Hi, Claire. Um, hi. Um, I had just done, uh, I had kind of a similar question from the kids this year, and I had kind of like did a little digging. And mm -hmm. what I found out was that when elected a cardinal, the official color, the official ring of the cardinal is sapphire. Okay, that makes sense, doesn't it? Because they do wear different colors. Right. So, yeah. so this, and of course, everybody thinks cardinal, but it would be a ruby because that's always the kids. You know, everybody votes yeah. for 95% yeah. say ruby. But mm -hmm. the actual um, color that I found out, which I kind of thought was strange, um, was that it was a sapphire, which supposedly only a cardinal can wear hmm. the sapphire. Um, the bishop has a different yeah. ring. That yeah. he would that he would wear. So, um, yeah. so yeah. So that's kind of and that's uh, um, Cynthia. That's my favorite book, uh, The Church Visible. Actually, mm -hmm. um, that's where I went digging for that one. Was in mm -hmm. the Church mm -hmm. Visible and, and found yeah. it, found it yeah. there. Yeah, it does make sense because it's not just a matter of the color, but they are entering. I mean, they're not entering into a new state, but they are entering into a new level. So. Um, you know, it does make sense. Um, and I was wondering, do you know if um, you were talking about the um, the ostrich fe feathers, the flabellum? Mm -hmm. um, I did some research on those, and I found that in the early 1900s, the Drexel family in Philadelphia replaced the original flabellum. Mm -hmm. And gave gave um, Rome new flabellum with the understanding that they took the old flabellum, and supposedly that they are on display um, at the University of Pennsylvania. Oh, and I I know, and I I cannot, and and I read this that this is where they are located. They are mm -hmm. supposed to be in showcases, but I can't. It must be the best kept secret at the U of P because I can't seem to locate. I didn't know if you knew anything about, because I go to the U of P at least once or twice a year. My husband um, is in, under medical care down there. Um, and I'm, every time I go down there, I'm trying to dig around and I would just love to see the flabellum up close, the original old yeah. ones, pre-1900. Well, do you, so do you know? A, yeah, so they're in a museum there. You should be able to call the person who runs the museum and ask. But I don't know the name of the museum that's, that's part of the mm -hmm. uh, University of Pennsylvania, like that 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 um, educational institution. Sure. I didn't know if you. I didn't know if you knew. No. Um, okay. The only I've seen uh, vestment displays uh, when my deceased husband and I were in um, in the Quebec area, and uh, then we saw them. Uh, in one of the museum right now I can't think of it off the top of my head but um, I'd like to you know that sounds like a road trip to me I'd love to go see them myself I know I've been yeah. trying to see them for like three years and I can't yeah. I can't quite locate them so I, I just thought yeah. I would ask and, well, well, and how many museums how many museums can there be at the University of Pennsylvania I mean I know it's big oh. but <laughs> right I know it's not yeah. that big right right yeah, exactly. right, right. Yeah. Right. No, we should be able to find that out. Okay. I'll mm -hmm. keep digging. <laughs> okay, okay. Anything else? Well, guys, I have to tell you that I enjoyed um, the last five weeks. Uh, it gave me sort of a dry run on this project that, uh, you know, I, I really want to develop uh, more information about vestments. I'm just fascinated by them.
And, it, you know, every time you turn around, you learn a new fact. It's like I feel like I'm become a mini encyclopedia on, invest, on investments. But um, it's been nice to have uh, an audience and to get the kinds of questions that I would not necessarily have thought of. So that's very helpful. So this has been a fascinating series. Um, uh, there's a, a book by Thomas Carlyle called Sartor um, uh, Resartus, The Tailor Retailored. And his point is, is that we are what we wear. Mm. And, we grow uh, into it. Yeah. We do. Yeah. And uh, uh, he goes through and he talks about uh, uh, police officers, their uniforms mm -hmm. that they wear, and how they become, through mm -hmm. that uniform, the embodiment of, uh, of their profession. And sure. It's the same thing with uh, our clergy. Mm hmm uh, any and, married people, and, any, anyone, anything, any change of vocation. Right. Yeah. So um, to, to know the history of vestments and how uh, whenever we look at somebody uh, in that uniform, mm -hmm. uh, what a good friend of mine, um, uh, Anne-Marie Kitts, once called the sin fighter suit. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, because uh, they they're out fighting sin. She says yeah. she called it yeah. the sin fighter. Uh, Anne Marie was uh, was uh, fun like that. She was an Old Testament scholar at Kenrick Glennon Seminary, and uh, she would talk about uh, the vestments that were worn uh, by Moses and Aaron. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, not really vestments, you know, but just uh, what they came to wear became uh, uh, habitual. Yeah, and maybe that's why they call it a habit. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. In, in any case, uh, so the next um, series, uh, Dr. Tulin Wilson, will have to be on uh, on uh, religious uh, vestments, such as uh, what religious sisters wear in different orders, and mm. maybe why one order wears uh, one kind of habit and another order wears a different kind of habit. Uh, mm -hmm. That would be an interesting sequel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a lot of work to do on this one yet. Um because no matter where I turn, when I'm looking at something, I find more information. I mean, really, I, as I said, I know it sounds weird, but I was looking at papal shoes and I thought, man, you know, you could write, a, you could write an MA thesis on this. And I know that it would be hard to find a director. <laughs> I want to write on papal shoes. But um, really, the amount of information um, you know, and how everything, everything has some symbol. You know, unfortunately, in this culture, I don't know, I think in other cultures that uh, are not as materialistic or hedonistic as ours, um, there might be uh, a better awareness of that, but, you know, of what those symbols mean. But here you actually have to sit down and go looking for them. You know, so we've lost a lot in this country. We really have. Well, um, uh, hopefully um, we've gained some things. Um, but, uh, you know, every, everything's always in a state of change and flux. And mm -hmm. so uh, we lose things and hopefully we gain better things. But um, yeah. it's not always the case. No, it's not. No, have, it's you ever not. Heard, have you ever heard of the Bata Shoe Museum in Toronto? No, it's five stories of nothing but shoes in their history. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm I'm just fascinated, you know, to think of, I mean, who would even be concerned with what the Pope puts on his feet? It's like, but there's all this meaning to it, mm -hmm. you know, so lo I love this stuff. Anyway, um, I hope that you've enjoyed uh, the last five weeks and, uh, I've certainly enjoyed the opportunity to talk to all of you. Okay. Um, and uh, if you, if you want to share this with anybody, it's wcatradio.com slash vestments. And so I'll put that here. That's where these are being posted. Um, I'll put it in the chat room. Mm -hmm. uh, wcatradio.com slash vestments. Um, all right. So uh, would somebody like to close us in prayer? I can. Okay. Um, this is the year of St. Joseph. Um, um, so Pope Francis told us. So 
um, I was doing a little work and I found, um, I, uh, we're going to do half the prayer of um, Pope Leo the Thirteenth. Um, who gave us the St. Michael the Arch, you know, the St. Michael the Archangel prayer um, after his um, vision, after um, saying Mass. So, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Mm -hmm. To you, O blessed Joseph, we have recourse in our affliction, and having implored the help of your most holy spouse, we now, with hearts filled with confidence, earnestly beg you to take us under your protection. Through that sacred bond of charity which united you to the Immaculate Virgin Mother of God, and by that fatherly love which you embraced the child Jesus, we humbly beg you to look graciously upon the beloved inheritance which Jesus Christ purchased by his own blood, and to aid us in our necessities with your power and your strength. Amen. Mm -hmm. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, please remember to pray for my stepdaughter, Linda Romano. Okay. Thank, you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah, bye-bye. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, doctor. Great to You're welcome.